Uh, my name is Mark Cumming and I'm the head of Colog and uh, I'm just doing a, a few quick uh, in, intros and then I'll hand over to our moderator now in a moment. Uh, Colog, as, as many of you know, is, is the association of people who have been involved in international development work and those interested in working for global justice uh, and maybe haven't worked in the global south. And our work uh, through the first webs is to try and um, connect up the local and the global and, and have a perspective on uh, justice issues, uh, bringing together perspectives from different parts of the world. Uh, tonight is a theme uh, very close to our heart in Kolov, uh, education, emancipation, and social change. Uh, and, and, and for us, if, again, if you, if you want to look up a bit more about Kolov, um, but um, raising that critical reflection, critical consciousness of people is a central part of our work and uh, our education for empowerment and social change um, is, 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 is what we're about. Um, yeah, we're, 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 we've been partnering with the Department of International Development in Manuk University for the last couple of years and hosting these nights. And uh, we're delighted to have uh, Paddy Riley uh, from the department uh, who will, will be moderating our session tonight and will be introducing you to the panel in, in, in a moment. Uh, and again, it, it's a real pr privilege, uh, Paddy. Uh, many of us um, who have worked in international development have studied in the old Kimmich Institute, uh, now in, in Maynooth, in the Department of International Development. And for a generation or more of people, Paddy, uh, you have been a, a wonderful uh, guide and mentor. Um, do subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, do share out uh, the video uh, from tonight with your contacts. It, 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 it will be up there. Uh, do drop questions into the live chat. Uh, on, on the YouTube and uh, Paddy will field them as the night goes on. Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, Kolov and our work, uh, do look us up on kolov.org and if you're interested in getting involved uh, um, as a member and or uh, donating to our work because we do rely on the donations of ordinary people as well for our work. Um, finally, uh, just to acknowledge the support of Concern Worldwide in helping us host uh, these particular events. And uh, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Paddy and enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for the kind words. I didn't think anyone even remembered me from my days in Kimmich, but thank you. That was nice. Uh, yes, I'm, my name is Paddy Riley and I work in the Department of International Development at Maynooth. And I'm delighted to introduce to you the panel of contributors uh, for this event. Uh, I'll begin with Alice Feldman, who's a lecturer in the School of Sociology at UCD and coordinates the MA in Race, Migration and Decolonial Studies. And Alice's work involves experiments at the intersections of art, research and pedagogy to mobilize creative agency. Uh, it, and it's particularly focused on decolonial knowledge justice projects, which I find fascinating. Over the last two decades, she's also worked in research, advisory and volunteer capacities for an array of groups involved in anti-racism, intercultural and integration work. My next, our next panel person is Patrick Essacon. Patrick is a priest. He's a member of St. Patrick's Missionary Society also known here in Ireland as the Kiltegan Fathers. Uh, Patrick's currently undertaking an MA in international development in Maynooth, and I'm pleased to say actually in the Department of International Development. Um, before coming to Maynooth, Patrick uh, was working for the previous eight years in Bauchi, the northern part of Nigeria, primarily with youth at the intersection of non-formal learning and training for young people and uh, helping them seek employment. Neve O'Reilly is the CEO of Aintus, the National Adult Learning Organization in Ireland, with 18 years experience in lifelong learning. Neve is an educationalist with expertise in the educational equality, learner voice, community education, policy analysis, organizational development, and governance. And Neve is chair of the Irish COVID-19 tertiary education response. 
on mitigating educational disadvantage, which will be, I'm sure will be discussed uh, this evening. She was appointed by the Minister for Education and Skills to two Irish state boards, the Quality and Qualifications Ireland, QQI, and SOLAS, the Further Education and Training Authority. And finally, Fergal Finnegan is a lecturer in the Department of Adult and Community Education in Maynooth and co-director of the Doctorate in Higher and Adult Education and the PhD programmes. Before becoming an academic, Fergal was a community adult educator and a literacy worker for a decade. And these experiences have strongly influenced and shaped his work. He's interested in how adult education can support transformative learning and contribute to egalitarian social change. Fergal edits the Journal of Transformative Education and is a co-convener of the European Society Research on Education of Adults, uh, a network on active dem democratic citizenship and adult learning. You're all very welcome and thank you for agreeing to contribute to this conversation this evening. So without further ado, uh, just get right into the conversation. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to say a little in response to the theme of this event. And I'll begin with Alice. Uh, and after this, we'll have some time to uh, cross over and share some further points that we uh, hear each other saying, and maybe even any Q&A questions that come up on the chat. So education, emancipation and social change. When you hear such a phrase, what does this mean for you, Alice, in terms of your work? Um, well, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I'm really, it's really nice to meet new people as well. And I'm looking forward to our conversation um, um, after we all do our bits and pieces because um, it's a really nice spread of different perspectives. And I guess when I was thinking about the theme, because one of the, the kind of areas of work that I've been trying to develop the last couple of years is this idea of knowledge justice, the relationship between knowledge justice and social justice. Um, and even more so that knowledge justice is a matter of global justice. If we looked at knowledge, education, pedagogy, as in the same ways that we do other global justice issues like climate and, and so on. Um, and I just, I hope you don't mind, but I, I uh, pulled out a, a quote um, from the South African scholar Sabelo Nlovo Gatshini. Um, in University of Cape Town, um, because sometimes other people's words are better than your own. But he really encapsulates, and I found him very um, extremely inspiring for my own work. And he notes that what the world is facing is a broad civilizational crisis, which loudly proclaims that modernity has produced many modern problems for which it has no modern solutions. And he conceives of this um, crisis as, as a double crisis, where the systemic crises like climate um, are intertwined with knowledge crises. And for him, knowledge crisis and knowledge crises are, he, he defines them as it's a deficit of knowledge and in particular, a deficit of diverse knowledges, of a diversity of knowledge. That is the crisis that he, that um, is argued that both has created the, the systemic crises because of you know, the, the centrality of Western knowledges and not having um, lots of you know, multiple conversations, the global um, resource of knowledges across um, different peoples, different experiences, different ways of being. So for him, it's an epistemic, it's a knowledge crisis that is um, the result of a deficit of knowledge and the diversity of knowledges. And so <clears throat> I find that very inspiring. And it also links into uh, another area like many other activists and scholars and educators. I work around trying to create um, different 
pedagogies and practices um, around cultivating what people are referring to as pluriversality. Okay, so instead of um, the sort of universal, what's kind of put forward as the universal Western, white male European Eurocentric knowledge as the universal knowledge, as the knowledge that um, again, another African scholar and Googie talks about moving the center. So rather than one center of a dominating knowledge, it's a world of <coughs> centers of knowledge, knowledges across many different ways of being um, and peoples and circumstances. Um, so I guess, so I immediately thought about pluriversality, which is, I guess, central to what I try to do with my teaching. And I suppose part of that, I mean, there's a lot of talk about decolonizing the curriculum and bringing in a globalized, pluriversal um, uh, array of materials. Um, but also for me, it's about um, incorporating, bringing what the students who are present bring with them because they all have their own knowledge worlds, their knowledge experiences, whether it's geographical difference, whether it's different ways of being, all of what is left out of the universalized, heteronormative, patriarchal, um, Eurocentric sort of knowledge that pervades universities and schools all around the world. Um, so yeah, so we're just trying to move the center in that respect. Um, so I like terms like the lived curriculum where there's a constant conversation um, where students um, are bringing in their own knowledges and that we organize the class around that. Um, there's that, uh, the Aoki has this thing about um, the difference between the planned curriculum and the lived curriculum. So very much what is happening in the moment. Um, what, again, what do students bring with them and how do I um, kind of organize pedagogical elements of the classroom, um, the ways of examining and sharing across different perspectives, using art and creative um, practices for assignments um, and leaving open the sort of closed view of whose knowledge counts what is the, the knowledge that we're here to disseminate um, and things like that. Uh, thanks, Alice, an awful, lot of, an awful lot in that. That will occupy us now for the rest of the evening, I think, your five minutes. Uh, some really good stuff there. A few uh, <coughs> interesting uh, quotes from uh, Ngugi and from, uh, I didn't catch the first one, and Lovo, Gicini, Gicini. Yeah, Gicini, yeah. Yeah, civilizational crisis and pluriversality. Yeah, uh, I really like some of those ideas. Can I just ask Patrick, just to follow on straight away on that same question, if you don't mind, about, you know, what, what does this, this term evoke for you, education, emancipation and social change? Thanks, Paddy, and thanks all panelists. Um... The very mention of the term, uh, the word education and emancipation and social change always evoked in me um, uh, words beyond, you know, the, the, the normal education, formal nature of education that we all know. And it carries also con uh, connotations of people gaining more skills and far beyond the skills they gain for maybe for, uh, for the sake of economic success and for the sake of achieving in life, uh, more things in life. Education is also uh, more of a, 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 an empowerment tool. The words of Mandela come to my mind when he says that education is the most pow powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And the power of education extends, as I said, uh, extends beyond the development of skills we need for economic success. And I feel sometimes that is a, uh, that is where we get it, you know, people get it wrong sometimes when pursuing, uh, following pursuits for uh, uh, education and decide to know more. It's more really about beyond the changing the world that is outside there, but it also the individual change that education can cut, uh, can impact on an individual. 
And uh, from my own experience, I want to share my own experience <clears throat> growing from a pastoralist community and how I witnessed education um, becoming a driver, uh, a driver of change in the society. Seeing our community a few years later, uh, maybe settling, you know, some of them who are no longer going about the animals, but some who have chosen settles, settles type of, uh, of lifestyle. And seeing the children going, to, uh, going through education and supporting them going through education with the hope that the children will come and transform the society for the best. And I think aspiration of everybody, of every parent, is always there to give the children the best education they can. And my experience of that too is I also witnessed, uh, even in my own ministry as a priest, how education has become very impactful in, in the lives of many people. As you mentioned, Paddy, there, where we run, I run, uh, I was working with the young people in the northern part of Nigeria, Bauchi, a part of the, of the country that is ravaged by the uh, insurgent activities of um, Boko Haram. Uh, but apart from that, what uh, always struck me was the exuberance of these young people, the desire, the commitment uh, to, to make a meaningful uh, impact in their lives, in their own lives and in the lives of the society. Some of them joined the small organization that we are running, cell, uh, sharing education and learning for life on a voluntary basis. They will come, they're trained, and then they go out there uh, to, uh, to teach their brothers and sisters on values of peace, values of peaceful coexistence. And I think those are, those are aspects of education uh, attributes or good, uh, good aspects of education that we will want to see uh, transforming communities as well. Um, apart from that, too, is <clears throat> when, when we engage them in conversations and hearing impact, uh, impact stories on how education has changed their lives beyond writing and reading, which is often <clears throat> in African context, was kind of uh, the ultimate, you know, if you know how to read and write, those were the basics or the rudiments of education. But beyond that, there was also another dimension of you know, education bringing the cultural side, making people accept their own culture, making people accept and understand the reality that surrounds them. And it also gave them opportunity to begin to ask questions. It raises awareness. I, I always like that bit. And I always felt that anytime I go to the villages and <clears throat> the villages there where we, we, we carry out these trainings and seeing women that have been enrolled in some of these um, ad adult education learning, seeing them making steps in the first early stages of the weeks of learning how to read, you know, or even how to say those alphabetical letters. Those, you know, I could see a kind of change in their lives. And eventually they'll be asking questions, you know, about the difference in alphabet letters and even in the write-ups or even in the, in the numericals. In those in small things, <clears throat> when they begin to write their names, or even begin to read Bibles or, you know, in their own native language. I could always say that that is how I see how impactful education is. The moment they begin to, to tell you, Father, look here, this is how now how I understand my life. This is what this means. You know, that they're able to contextualize the realities within their lives and, and the circumstances within their own lives in their own context. And, you know, to, and if they try to have a better grasp of, what those realities mean for them. So that is where I underscore the, the social uh, change or the social change dimension of education. The emancipatory side is, is in the raising of awareness, beginning to ask questions. I have encountered situations whereby some of our young trained people begin to ask questions about social inequalities in the society. They begin to ask, you know, why, why are we doing things like this? You know, why not the other way? And I, I always find that quite, uh, quite uh, interesting. But it is in the process of asking questions, in the process of trying to raise awareness and asking all these questions that they begin to also to, you know, to understand how things are. But the, a big, the biggest learning for me is the sequence at which you know, they go through. I, I see them from the asking and then coming to an understanding and in the naming of the world and the challenges themselves. Some of them end up even, some of them ended up maybe, you know, becoming leaders in their communities. And, and that was quite, uh, that, that was quite uh, something for me. 
uh, seeing them from an early ages when age when I was joining with them and eventually seeing some of them now becoming leaders in their own communities um, raising concerns for their own people speaking for their own people and these are minority groups that have been marginalized by the dominant Muslim communities in Bauchi so the presence of these young people in this in this uh, uh, cell program has helped them given them a voice given them a voice that they're able even to hold their leaders into account, uh, into accountable and even to task them, you know, ask them like, you know, uh, very difficult questions around issues, around budgets, issues around interreligious dialogues, you know, why they're left out in the peace building processes and all that. So that is how I understand the uh, education and emancipation and also uh, social, uh, social change party. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Thank uh, you. Really, I suppose, <clears throat> brings us right back down to the ground in, in what you, you say, I have a very grounded view of this. And you've, I picked up that you, you know, from your own personal experience, your own personal odyssey that you talked about coming from a pastoralist background and becoming, becoming a driver of change in your own right. But then what you have perceived in your work in Bauchi, uh, you know, really is impactful. And, uh, you know, th those terms empowerment really do mean something, you know, uh, changing lives is is transforming, whatever way we might want to call it that, you know, and uh, the cultural appreciation or a new look that people have of their own culture is a way of naming their world, of course, and uh, uh, fascinating for all of that. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, moving swiftly on to, can I ask Neve to share your insights that, you know, come for you from that, that general theme, you know, education, emancipation and social change, perhaps in terms of your work with Entus. Yeah, thanks very much, Paddy. And thanks very much, Alice and Patrick, for such a lovely, rich contributions. I'm going to talk about policy. I hope it's not going to be too dry, <laughs> but um, I suppose it. that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> that's my challenge. Um, but really, I want to talk about uh, education, emancipation, social change in the context of advocacy and advocacy as a space to learn in itself. So maybe just to say a little bit about AIM, this is the National Adult Learning Organization, a uh, civil society organization with over 400 members. Um, we engage in communications, research, capacity building and advocacy work. And we have an absolute passionate belief about the power of education to transform people's lives. And we see it as a, a tool for social change. So what does all of that mean? I mean, in terms of this, it's like, how can we marry our principles and what we believe in, in, in how we advocate? And I want to just kind of give an example of our advocacy work and where we try to bring in uh, the work of Paolo Ferreri as, and his pedagogy into the work that we do. So I suppose where we stand uh, and we're not neutral. So we want to challenge the status quo of education because we believe it's inherently um, unequal. We side with the people who uh, didn't derive benefit from the education system and are very passionate about that. Uh, we promote the value of all learning um, in all its um, diversity um, and that it all should be treated equally. Um, and it's not about helping people who are marginalized, it's how we work with people to support them, to build their capacity to have a voice and to speak their truth of the impact of educational inequality. Um, and when we talk about education for transformation, we really look at education um, at the core of that and having spaces for such discussions that we've heard um, Patrick talk about there. So I suppose the question for ourselves is like, how is this enacted? But I can't talk about this without talking about the thorny issue, particularly in advocacy, which is the education for the skills agenda or the broader purpose of education for emancipation. And this becomes a topic of discussion so often. So I don't want to get into it in huge detail, but I think I need to put it onto the table. We know the, the dominance of the skills agenda in terms of the focus, in terms of how education is funded, um, about you know, addressing the skills gap in the economy, um, but also in terms of what we're trying to do in AIMS is, is keep promoting the value um, of education and, and all its purposes. And what struck me recently, we had an event about Paolo Freire and we talked to educators and they were afraid to talk about education for emancipation. They didn't want to talk about it in their institutions. They wanted this, and I kind of, kind of have a question. It's like, what can we do collectively about building I suppose, a greater understanding about the transformative power of education and for people not to be afraid to talk about it. Now, I understand the implications 
around funding and ensuring that your programs get funded. But there was a real fear. Uh, so I think that's something that we need to address. I think there's plenty of positive things that are happening uh, in the policy landscape around transformative uh, education. Um, and then UNESCO, I mean, they have the four pillars of education, learning to be, to do, to know, to live together. They've added an additional one, learning to transform. And I mean, it's probably not that surprising because of the humanistic viewpoint that UNESCO has around education. But I do think there are, you know, a broadening um, out, particularly during COVID, of the broader purpose of learning. So I'm going to set that aside and now just talk about what we try to do uh, in AIMPUS around marrying our own principles and how we engage with people uh, with advocacy. And that was one of the reasons why it's so important is that the systemic impact of education inequality and the exacerbation of disadvantage during COVID is absolutely real. I think there's not enough information that's been put out about it, but we know that it's been a 25% drop in the number of travelers and the Roma community engaging in further education training, a 15% drop in people with disabilities, people over 50, um, you know, and refugees and asylum seekers. So that's just some statistics uh, that we know that are happening. So we ask ourselves, like, how do you advocate with people who are in the focus of policy, uh, who rarely have a voice at the table uh, and who we're trying to work with? So I suppose to give an example of the National Fet Learner Forum, and there's somebody on the panel who has supported this work over the last five years. And when we started this project, if we even just take a step back, what it was was to get the perspective of learners on their learning experience uh, in further education and training. So it sounds quite dry in a sense, okay, they say what's working, what's not working. But what we found over the last five years is that the process of learners describing their experience is incredibly powerful. And through the support of you know, many people uh, and advisory groups, we try to bring in those frere and like uh, pedagogic approaches where dialogue was at the center. We tried to have really deep um, discussions with learners around their experiences build their capacity, their agency, their confidence to be able to voice uh, their opinion. And I just want to quote a learner who was at the forum and he talks about the word voice is quite striking. It's not for nothing that it's called learner voice. Everyone's voice is as important as everyone else's. And I think that for so many people, for so many reasons, their voice has been or still is muted over the years. Education can be a route away from the muted voice. Knowing that learners are listened to and that they have an input in their own education is so important. So as was what we took for granted at the beginning was trying to improve the process in practice. And really what learners were saying to us uh, about it was the process itself was really empowering and it was transformative. And that's something that we we're trying to aspire to. So that work is led out by my colleague, uh, Leah, Kalia, Laura and Aki. And really what we tried to then look at, and my colleague Derbal, uh, so the credit is all their fantastic work that they have done was around developing a program, learners as leaders. So it was people, learners who are already involved in advocacy and how we could develop a program for them to share their experiences um, in an authentic way. And just to give you an example of that, um, we worked with the ability board. So it's people with uh, disabilities um, and we developed a curriculum with them for an advocacy program. And what they looked at was they're critically reflecting on their own personal learning journey, identifying the barriers to education, describing what a transformative learning process is, uh, creating campaigns and examining the need to advocate. And here is some of the work that they've done. So I sneaked in a PowerPoint slide here. What we used like, and what my colleague used art uh, as a methodology for people to share their experience and their voice. And I think it's really powerful that you, what you can see uh, and how they developed that. So I suppose there are just some examples um, of advocacy work where we're trying to bring in some methodologies that would be in keeping with education for transformation um, and doing it in a way uh, that is authentic to the values and it's a work in, pro in progress. So, and really, so just to say a couple of things from what learners have said about this experience and where they talk about, Amy talked about, we have the right to have a say just because we look different or talk different and whatnot doesn't mean we don't know what's going on in the country. Uh, Florin talks about, I don't want people to make decisions about my life. I want to be, make my own decisions and I just want to have a normal life. And a lot of the discussions that they had around the advocacy work was a feeling of being silenced and the need to uh, be heard. So they had very powerful uh, views on that. So there's some examples of how what we try to do um, through our work in Aintus and through the support of um, members and learners uh, to advocate for this kind of learning, but to try and put it in practice in an advocacy context as well. So I'll pass back to yourself, Paddy. Thanks. 
Neve, thanks a million. That's that's really interesting. I mean, all kinds of things were going off in my head as you were talking. Uh, uh, some of them relevant, uh, <laughs> but uh, I was struck by the statement you made early on about it, that Aintus's work is not all about helping people who are marginalised, but working with people. You know, I thought that was a very profound statement. And then the the debate, and I think we we it might be useful for us to get onto that later. But we'll see where where it goes. That that question about the skills agenda versus whether we can be truly transformative. You know, those, those different pressures on a lot of people that are working in the sector. Um, and the caution among participants at your Freire event, that was the thing that triggered off all kinds of ideas for me because as a department, I'll just mention a conflict here of interest here. We're planning a Freire event for his anniversary of his birth later on in September, October. No, probably lots of others are, maybe Fergal as well in Maynooth. So uh, we're, we'll be talking to probably some of you again about this. And we're looking at how we can, we can have a useful seminar, even if it possibly still may be online at that stage, indeed. So I was fascinated by that because all of those kind of tensions are there, you know, about whether we can have a truly Freirean approach that is political uh, with a small p and struck by what you were saying about people, the learner voice and the process itself was emancipatory or empowering, you know, and uh, the final thing about a work in progress, that could be the motto of a lot of work in education. It's a work in progress. So th they're just some of the highlights. Uh, there was a lot of stuff in there. The advocacy and policy issues are really too important to leave out. So thank you, Neve, for that. Uh, quite interesting, complementary, but different perspective on what we've heard so far. So uh, Fergal, uh, can I ask you the same question then, just in terms of issues yeah. that arose for you from that, that general theme? Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to, to respond to that. And I really want to thank you and the others in Colo for holding this discussion. I think this is a vital topic, it really is. And I was excited to, to see it and I look forward to the discussion later and I've enjoyed what, what Alice and Patrick and Neva said a great deal, and I'm going to overlap and hopefully complement what they've said already. Mm. I guess um, I'm speaking as somebody who's been involved in adult education for about 20 years, and that's where I come, come to this topic from. And uh, it's, um, I, I think it's pretty useful to say that I stumbled into adult education. I, just, I, was, I was doing a building job and I, I, I passed a literacy centre on on Mount Joy Square, and I became involved by adult education almost <clears throat> by mistake. But what happened because of that was I discovered a whole way of doing things, a whole way of seeing things. And I, I've discovered decades, even, even longer, generations of experiment in pedagogies and <clears throat> um, new forms of institution, which, which are adequate for human beings, which, are, which, which promote development, which uh, support emancipation. And it's become a really a really, it was an important discovery for me. And uh, I, I said, I discovered that as totally new, even though I was already interested in questions of equality and politics and all that type of stuff. I've been involved in political campaigns. So in, in some ways, I think holding this question of what is emancipatory education to the fore in, in for institutions and for movements is really, really important. I think there's, you know, it's one of the most important questions we can answer. And we, when you talk about the poly crisis that Alice is discussing and or the type of inequalities, the enduring and worsening inequalities that, that Neve talked about or the type of conflicts Patrick's talking about, you know, this is, this is a vital topic. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess my contribution here is to say that there is decades of experience in trying to work out how to do that. And uh, I, I probably, what I'm going to do is highlight five points, which I think come from the literature, come from research, come from my experience which may not surprise many people, but I think they're worth reiterating because they're so fundamental. And, and the first is, is that, um, that, you know, adult education, emancipatory adult education has to, the means and the ends have to be commensurable. You cannot have, you know, emancipation as your goal and not act in a free and democratic way. And actually to do that is very tricky. 
And that is not what exists in most educational institutions in Ireland. That's the point is this, this takes considerable innovation to, to get to that. The second point, which is related to, to that, the idea that you have to presume equality and act on equality, uh, practice freedom is, is, is to say that people's lived experience, their knowledge of the world has to be vital in any emancipatory educational process. And that finding ways of dialoguing with people, discovering things, uh, working through themes is crucial. You know, it's a Ferrarian idea, but it's, it's a, a, a very important. And once again, I would say that a lot of educational institutions do not work towards that, that vital insight. Um, the third is, is that uh, ex our experience is vital, but it's, it's not really enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient, if you want. And, um, you know, what, what we want through emancipatory education is to enhance people's capacity to critically reflect on themselves, on the world, on their context, to, to be able to deal with complexity, to be able to deal with diversity, to, to be able to see their own assumptions, to be more discerning, more discriminating. But I think, and this might be a point for discussion with other panel members or, or people who are listening, I think that also means learning reflexive agency through engaging with certain forms of political knowledge. And that does mean understanding systems and our role in them. That does understand uh, mean understanding um, the imperatives that drive our world. And that takes an awful lot of work to try and work between those systemic explanations and lived experience in a democratic and open way is a real challenge, but it is incredibly productive when it's, when it's done correctly. Um, I think that is only sustained um, through a type of hopefulness. Uh, you know, again, quite a Ferrarian theme. He's been mentioned a couple of times already. Uh, that's hope in people's capacities. That's, ho that's uh, hope in and having, having a sense of historical possibility. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful adult educator called Raymond Williams. He said, you know, you know, the point of critical engagement is is to make hope practical and despair convincing. It is about finding ways of acting in the world in an emancipatory way. Um, the last thing I want to say is, and this comes pretty pretty directly from personal experience, is that whilst I'm saying that certain forms of political knowledge and explanation are vital, while I'm saying organic connections between social movements and educational institutions are vital, that networking between civil society and the classroom is, is vital, all, all these things. I think we have to be at the same, uh, whilst we're politically bold and engaged and have clear analyses, we also have to be epistemologically modest in, in, in the face of the complexity of people's lives, in, in, this, in our certainty that our political explanations cover what people need. And I think one of our experiences in Maynooth was uh, on one particular course was in trying to uh, work between various social movements and, and their members. And it just takes a lot of time and a certain amount of humility for people to see each other. And I think building alliances is crucial. I think it, the type of situation we're in, the deep crisis we're in, uh, requires that we, we build alliances and we try and find ways of building emancipatory um, uh, education in a sustainable way. And that I think is, is to an extent what Neve was talking about because in, in some ways people get a lot of energy and they say, let's, let's do this type of very engaged um, development of people's critical capacities. And then because there isn't funding or there isn't backing or people get burnt out, it, it, it gets left to one, one side. So finding ways of sustaining that are incredibly important. And when you see centers like Highlander in, in the Southern United States or other certain initiatives that last over generations, it becomes a repository for a type of memory of emancipation that can be reactivated. And that is something which is really profound and, and useful. Uh, so I think I'm going to leave that, the question of sustainability and, and how we network for the discussion. But I think that those are profound questions, not least in terms of in this uh, strange virtual world we're in at the moment. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Fergal. Uh, God, an awful lot there really as well, you know. Um, thank you for those. Uh, and yeah, I'm fascinated with your, your beginning that you stumbled into this. Uh, that's very useful that you stumbled into it, you know. Uh, I could say the same myself, actually. I'm, I'm an accidental academic. I've often said, you know, how I managed to get here, I don't know. And I haven't been found out yet. But who knows, there's still time. 
Uh, I, I'm just just looking at the, across the notes there. There's they're starting to get threads of commonality coming in, of course, because of uh, not surprisingly because of the way that the panel was was constructed. And uh, I can see we're 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 uh, we're going in the same direction, but perhaps in some cases using slightly different pathways towards that 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 end. One of the Questions, I, I just, can I just put this out there because of some of the things I've heard, um, especially from the last two sp speakers, but, but perhaps also from Patrick and Alice as well, uh, is, 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 you know, because one of the things, the question when it was first put to me by, by Mark Malone was education, emancipation and social change. I felt, I wondered if there should be a question mark at the end of that. Uh, so I'm just wondering if, how would you respond to the argument uh, that it's not the role of education to be engaged in social change? And I think Neve kind of touched on that a little bit, you know, uh, because of the skills agenda and the, the need for us, especially those government funded to service the economy, never mind the society. Um, but it's not the role of education. I have these debates sometimes in class, even with undergrads or postgrads, that, that you know, education really should be apolitical when it comes to social change and have this kind of modest approach to it there. Uh, you know, some educationalists, I know you'll be aware, is that the role is largely conservative and function is the socialization of the young and the preservation of the social order. So, do we see from our respective viewpoints here uh, the need for a much more radical model of education that some of you have hinted at? And yeah, I'm just wondering, is that, is that feasible, uh, you know, from, where, from the standpoint now? Or are we destined uh, that this approach that some of us have talked about regarding education, especially when we use the word frere, uh, and transformative education and emancipatory education, people like Jane Thompson, who come to mind. Uh, um, and I was thinking actually of Stephen McCloskey and stuff he's doing in development education, as you were talking, Fergal, about the, the kind of building networks and alliances at the end, because I've read a paper recently of his that echoes those points. Um, you know, often, uh, any kind of uh, people-centered, shall we call it that, education that I think is the, one of the common threads I've seen, uh, may be regarded as the Cinderella of education, you know, uh, one that is, uh, you know, on the margins and it's not valued in the mainstream because of that. So I just wanted to put that out there, even uh, if I'm not diverting you away from other things you want to talk about, you can work your way back into it. But I'm fascinated whether or not you think we can be more uh, upfront about our agenda. How can we do that? Can we have an overtly uh, value laden uh, objective for social change? And if anyone wants to jump in on that and, and answer, we, we don't have to go in any particular order. Please, please do so. Okay, Paddy, can I just can I add my voice there? Please do. Yeah, uh, I think um, considering the trends in education in the past few decades, there's no doubt uh, there's a paradigm shift already. And I've seen, uh, I'll give example, back in Africa, especially in Kenya, uh, governments have gone back to the drawing board, you know, to revisit the value of education they've been offering. And I've always, you know, I've always, apart from uh, questioning the content, of education that we received three, 30 years ago and uh, the value of that education, whether it's still viable and whether it's still practical, serving the needs of uh, particularly the African generation of our own time. I think education cuts across generational issues and also cuts across the cultures. And I think the idea of uh, foster education, fostering multicultural, the diversity of cultures and also lighting concerns about the social justice and also the cultures of uh, the cultures of the minorities is very very important. 
And I saw that Kenyan government moved from the 844 system to, they have introduced, they're going to introduce a new system of education. And I think many other, other Africans, African countries are revisiting uh, the education system they've been offering or running through for the past decades. But interestingly, is factors that are, have influenced or necessitated a need for paradigm shift in the education sector. I think it became clear that the content of education received from 70s and 80s and 90s in Africa didn't serve the African need. That was just, I'll give an example. You know, myself in secondary school learning about Vasco da Gama or the tallest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. You know, and all those things, or t t learning about uh, Berlin Conference and all that. And I keep on asking myself, what the hell? I've never been to Berlin, but I know one day I'll be there. But I have, there are historical, historical sentiments that I evoked when near the, you know, the Berlin Conference alone, the partition, the scumbag partition of Africa. This is me now in 21st century. So that's why I say the paradigm shift is already taking taking place and and I hope it's taking place in the right way. It also calls, I, I did mention in my in my first uh, point there that uh, the young people are beginning to ask questions, asking questions about the world around them, realities around them. And I think that the results of that awareness will eventually stimulate the questioning of reality and also propose changes to the status quo. And that is where the shift will happen. Thank you. Can, and thank you, thank you. Can I follow on from that? Me too, Alice. Yeah. Um, because I would almost even uh, turn the question around. Um, because, well, I come from a perspective that educate. There's no way education isn't political. Um, so, so that's there's there's no that it, it's it's a it's a myth or a fallacy that that education is not political, especially even when you're using terms of, well, it's to socialize children into the, you know, or assimilate, integrate, socialize. That's all about creating a particular social order and people to, to slot into it, et cetera, et cetera. So, and everything that we've all spoken about. Um, so, so the idea that, I mean, in the current moment, educating for skills and educating for emancipation are inextricably linked. I, like for me, the skills that people in the world, whether they're young people, adult learners, whatever, you know, around, regardless of where you are, where you're placed, um, the two are intertwined. And those are the skills that we need. And it also depends on, well, and who, when we say emancipation, who are we talking about, right? So I'm thinking again about what, what people in the world need, the skills they need to, to um, confront and foment social change in the context of these crises. So for me, um, we, we have to even emancipate our systems, right? And, and I know um, Neve said, oh, you know, policy institutions, it's all, you know, a bit dry, but that's part of what we're all working in. Every time we're in a classroom or every time, you know, we're, we're planning and, and trying to cultivate um, these pedagogies, um, we're still embedded in the, the, the power structures and the limitations of even just the language that we can use, right? And, and so, so I guess what I'm responding to is everything that everyone's talked about what they do seems to be positioned or we are positioning that somehow outside it's the peripheral. Oh, it's the emancipatory stuff. It's the Frarian stuff, right? That's the, the outsider stuff when it's actually the center of where we need to go. And, and I think Patrick was, was saying that center, that's already, we've already been shifting the center. I mean, our institutions need to catch up and we need to, to force that change. And, and I'm finding in the Irish context, students who are coming into my class, they intuitively know that they need more. They need different knowledges. They, they, they need to know more about where they're, what world they're living in, 
Okay, they know that there's a deficit there. They know that there is a very narrow selection in what they're provided in. And yeah, and that was, yeah, and that was the other thing that I was thinking too when, um, when um, the COVID situation was mentioned. Um, yeah, there are huge impacts on face-to-face on -face and disadvantage and access to that. But one of the things that I've been really, um, really profound in, in Ireland is the Zoom effect has created access to public space of community education, community educators, community leaders, creatives, um, it's it, public pedagogy. There are more people in Ireland of all ages, of all persuasions, um, of all walks of life, bringing all kinds of knowledges from around the world into the public space. And I think that's just a very practical thing that, that, that's very inspiring. So there, I think, and I definitely agree with Patrick, the changes ha are already being made. And I think, you know what, so what if we, sorry, it's going around to what if we changed our conversation to, you know, can we be emancipatory to having a conversation as though the emancipatory element and, and, and our different objectives and agendas and aspirations around it is the central, is the center. Do you know what I'm saying? So what would our conversation be like? Um, rather than saying, is it possible to start from the assumption that this is what we want to grow? Um, and then we're not always having that conversation and responding to the, the, the constraining structures, institutional structures in which we work. Yeah, just very briefly. I agree with that. I think in a, in a way you can simply ask yourself, can we afford not to? Mm, exactly. You know, I mean, anybody who deals with people who've come through uh, education and in various ways knows that it doesn't, it doesn't serve all people equally at all. We know that already. We know we face complex, wicked problems to solve. And we know that there's, a, you know, education can be incredibly powerful in empowering people. We also know that we're spending an extraordinary amount of our resources on it. So we need to, <laughs> you know, can we afford not to, to design an education system that gives people greater amounts of agency in their own lives? I guess I would say. Yeah, I was struck, uh, Fergal, by that point you made when you, you listed your five precepts, if you like. The very first one you talked about the means and ends being commensurate. That's what I thought of as, as Alice was uh, con sharing her concluding thoughts there, that if we sh we turn the question around, you know, so what would that look like if if something is if if the end goal is emancipation, how do we ensure that we we we, we behave in an emancipatory way, that we act in a, in a man, an emancipatory way, you know? Can I come in? Yeah, okay. please do need. Yeah, Virgil um, on the spot there. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Was that just Virgil? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no like, we talk about this so often um, for so many years about about this topic, and I wouldn't want it to be seen as something that's binary as well. That you know, there's emancipatory education over here, and then there's a skills agenda here. But it's something that comes up so much with our members and the fear of talking about um, um, education for emancipation. Uh, been a fear of that in their own institution um mm. i thought that was the question and then when i talked about like um, ability at work that's an employability program but they use uh for area methodology and pedagogy in it so if you looked at the face of it if you just read it uh, as it was you, you may not think that but mm. I, I suppose there's been a lot of talk in policy recently around transformative it was a word used by the minister yesterday in, in his address um and I think there is an opportunity to explain what that is and show how important it is and we can't afford not to because show me a place in the world where the skills agenda has been really effective in including everybody in the education system and it just does we know emancipatory education also works to engage people um, who you know didn't derive the benefit from the education system um, initially but I think there's a lot of kind of a, a move towards it I mean even the OECD have a Centre for Wellbeing, Inclusion and Sustainability. I wouldn't have imagined that a couple of years ago, talking about adult education. So, I mean, that's just, you know, obviously I'm not looking there, 
for inspiration, but it's become more into the mainstream, the discussion around this. So I would be very positive, but I think it's the it's approach, it's the pedagogy and, and where it happens, um, whether it's in a skills program, whatever it is, in an advocacy in different spaces we need, not necessarily just in the education system, I was saying in an advocacy uh, space as well, but I would be very hopeful um, for, for this, um, the kind of education we're talking about into the future. Thanks, Neve. Uh, actually, just can I just share a couple of chats that have been sent in to me. Uh, Owen says, uh, talking about education in terms of the ability to be able to ask questions is a really insightful and an important point, Patrick. Uh, and then, and then Beji Jibe, I, I think from Nigeria, is yeah. saying decolonizing the curriculum this is very important looking at our experience in Nigeria. Yeah. Any educational process that does not translate to emancipation can only further emasculate the people. And then uh, somebody more recently has said, the, uh, uh, a question for Neve. I think this is already being said now, a question for Neve linked to what she said earlier is why is official Ireland so afraid of Freire? I don't know if you actually said that, but we, <laughs> uh, such that educationalists are afraid to mention Freire at public events. Perhaps all the panel too. Oh, it looks as though she's coming to that question already. So you've already, I think, addressed that need. You know, but I hear what you were saying. You know, sometimes those words can be in themselves uh, threatening in some ways. You know, I was fascinated in the in the sphere of development education just to mention by Tupany Worth. Uh, and, and citing people like uh, uh, McCloskey and Andreotti and people like that, that uh, the, the language can be important. But I was also fascinated that in a way, official Ireland, to use that term, moved a hell of a long way with, uh, certainly in the days before the economic crash anyway, I'm going back to my hinterland now in Kimmage, there was, uh, they, bought, they went on board with the whole development education agenda and use language I never thought a government department would use. But, you know, they use the word transformation and things like that, you know. Now, whether they, the transformation they had in mind was the same as the transformation that we might use, you know. Or as Alice was saying earlier, uh, emancipation for whom, you know. <laughs> you know, there are questions that we have to continually engage with. So it was fascinated with, with that, that, Patrick, you're right, maybe there is a paradigm shift, but we're possibly sometimes too close to the trees, to use that cliche, that we can't always see uh, what's happening around us. You know, we have to take a step back and say, well, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a path moving that way. I don't know if anyone else wants to chip in on that. Yeah, but I just want to say that uh... In as much as we, we desire for the paradigm shift in education, emancipatory education, I think I want to reiterate the fact that there's a need to adopt it to the needs and capacities of individuals, and at the same time also meet the demands of the society. I think that is a point of departure in terms of uh, the current or the present education systems that we have. I keep on asking myself, you know, uh, going back home with the, my masters, you know, after I bagged my masters for me, no, go back home. I keep on asking myself, apart from working, you know, making use of it in the, my ministry and the development areas that I've worked, like I keep on, the question that I always at the back of mind is, is it meeting the demands or the needs of my society where I come from? I know I've gotten it in a different in Europe, but I'm going, but I won't be here. It has to speak to, it has to be relevant to my people back at home. Mm -hmm. That is always, in every module I interact with, uh, that is always at the back of my mind. How will this, you know, be adapted to the needs and capacities of my people and meet the needs of my people back at home? Mm -hmm. I say this based on two things. One, I always feel that um, uh, the use of language itself, I think Neve or some, uh, one of the panelists I mentioned, the use of language itself in, in, as a means of uh, passing knowledge has created a lot of uh, inequalities. I imagine yeah, uh, one of my flatmates here is a Chinese 
Chinese nationalists and he struggles talk alone you know speaking English understanding it is another thing and yet he has to go through all the modules all through his master's program in English and I also ask myself you know English is not my first language but when we talk of emancipation how can we be emancipated when the education we're receiving is in the language of the colonial master it defeats the purpose of emancipation. If emancipation means really that we have to question the status quo, we have to, you know, talk of liberating people. Liberation in the sense that people, uh, people, people are beginning to stand on their own, speak for themselves. And I think language becomes a powerful tool to communicate that. But when they can't express themselves in the right language, I imagine myself doing studies in my own native language, maybe language that is uh, that is my first language it will be completely different how i com i comprehend or conceptualize concepts will be quite different but this is the dilemma we are in now for conventional sake we're meant to go through this system i think that the use of uh, language english language per se i think for me has exposed more of more inequalities uh, than you know than we expect uh, in the emancipatory side of education the second part is also my hope is that education eventually will recognize also the, uh, the value of indigenous language uh, knowledge. I always feel that uh, our social cultural differences, we bring so much. And I think um, one of the panelists mentioned that, that was uh, uh, Fegal. And uh, she said that the, the, lived, the students bring with them, you know, the lived, what they call the lived curriculum. What students bring with them. And I, and I think that is, that is another level of education, valuing the experiences that the learners bring into the institutions. But how often do we, uh, do these institutions in the global north appreciate that? When everything is seen from the lens of the West, it's, it's, you know, it's the, you know, then the global south becomes only a kind of a container to receive, we'll be at the receiving end. And it, it will defeat the process of learning, which is meant to be more interactive exchange of knowledge, exchange of experience. So I will really lay emphasis, emphasis on recognizing the, the value of indigenous knowledge for the benefit of both indigenous, but also mainstream cultures. Thank you. Can I, sorry, I know we're, we're getting to time, but I really want to follow on from some of the things that Patrick said, because um, one thing that really struck me is the discourse around educating for skills. Um, we act like, I mean, that's kind of like, has that curriculum or has that the substantive stuff changed any time in the last, maybe it's time we need to reevaluate what are the skills that are necessary because the traditional job markets and labor markets and career paths and industries that's all changed utterly. Mm. Um, and there are, we, you know, there, there's a sense that, especially with COVID, you know, maybe made this more brought to the, to the fore, but we don't even know how the world is going to need to work um, so that students or, or people need a whole different set of skills that come from like the whole notion of lived experiences and embodied knowledges. Um, you know, that's, people have a sense or are trying to find their way or there, there's something, you know, so maybe it's time in Ireland that there needs to be just a, a fundamental reevaluation of what do we mean by educating for, for skills because we don't, we're not fulfilling that. The skill, the need for skills have changed. You, you need, and again, it's this, this inextricable link between, so even just asking good questions and reflexivity, is that considered dangerously um, emancipatory and political, or is that just a fundamental need? And then the other piece where this kind of comes around is um, because like so much of the scholarship that I use in terms of decolonizing, 
um, chain, you know, shifting the, the, the domination of your Eurocentric curricula. Um, that comes from scholars in the global south, particularly in Africa. So here's this opportunity for a south to north shift, a shift from everything, knowledge coming from the global north to the, to the global south, and people from the global south attending, you know, education in the global north to bring something back. Now we have a chance, you know, we need to shift that direction because what so much of what's going on in the, the education systems in African countries, the unfinished business of decolonization and emancipation from colonial rule and still having all of those inheritances, recalibrating things to focus on the needs and the knowledges of the people. You know, so now we have, and that's why that's, the, that's the, the knowledge that I'm turning to, to look at how can things be done differently? How do things need to change in terms of pedagogy, in terms of institutions as well? So I think, and that's this sort of whole thing about pluriversality that everyone brings. So when we have international students come to study in Ireland, bringing that knowledge with them for an exchange and a collaboration not just a dissemination of, of you know, the, the white European curriculum. And Ireland has its own history and its own unfinished business of the inheritances of colonial rule and the change of the education system you know, is, is still very much mirrored on the European path that, that we took as a country. Um, so there are whole rich areas and questions around um, taking on some of these other projects that, that other post after colonial countries have done. Alice, thanks very much. Uh, some really interesting questions there. How long have we got? We've got another hour to go, I think, have we? <laughs> I'm just struck by some of the questions I'd love to dive further into and even one or two uh, texts co coming in, but, but there, some of them are whoppers of questions that I think we would need at least another half an hour to begin to answer. So I might skip over those. We'll see how we go. Are you okay if we go run a little past uh, quarter past eight or have you, That's okay. you got, have you got better things to go to? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it just, I'm conscious that there's a few issues arising that, that we'd like to just not cut off too short anyway, in view of some of the points that have been made. Um, and Alice, you, you've mentioned a couple of times now, and I think it is the elephant in the room. So maybe we'll just tack on that for a little bit. The, how, how we've actually worked in the COVID situation. I know uh, Neve has some expertise in this area, I think as well, at least at a policy level. Um, but just, I suppose, how, how has your work been affected and let's start in a positive way, you know, because I'm struck that that we've mentioned that some new lessons emerged for some of us during the pandemic that maybe we can carry over into our future work. I don't know that even when we get back to normal, whatever that is, that maybe the, the, we, we've learned a few things about how to, uh, I suppose, uh, share more public, uh, what was the term that, that was used? Uh, public pedagogy, I think you'd mentioned uh, Alice at one stage, and you know this sense of people having a broader uh, sharing of community. You know, instead of us being constrained by whoever was signed on to a particular course. Um, so I'm just interested if anyone wants to share. Look, one of the things I learned from the lockdown was that we can do a certain few things, but we've also suffered in some ways, whatever way you want to approach it. Would anyone like to jump in on that, please? I suppose um, my greatest learning uh, coming, you know, to Ireland in the midst of the lockdown um, to start my master's program is uh, getting used to the, the virtual learning. I think that's a big, that was a big thing for me Initially, I'd hoped that I'll have, you know, more interactive in-class sessions and all that, but it didn't work. Um, I've not met all my, my classmates, you know, and uh, we're almost finishing the program. Uh, it's a pity. And I hope that uh, probably in the future, 
we'll come back and get to know each other in, a, in another form. But I, I think my lesson too that is that uh, uh, COVID pandemic, COVID-19 exposed a lot of things in the world that were not addressed before, a lot of inequalities, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, critical things that were swept under the carpet, I would say. I will give an example back at home, you know, back in Africa, especially Kenya and Nigeria, where I've worked and where Kenya, where, where I'm from. It's, it's, it's a complete uh, different ballgame. It's a complete different ballgame. It's all politics as usual. And yet the numbers of the cases are going up, new cases are going up. Kenya just, you know, we locked up parts of the country last, uh, last week. But apart from that, there are people who have also, the cases of corruptions that emerged, the abuse, misuse of COVID-19 funds, you know, people became millionaires and billionaires of a, you know, all of a sudden because of the funds that were given, you know, um, because to help people cushion against the effects of the pandemic. And yet it ended up in the pockets of a very few. So it brought out, it brought out a lot of things, it changed the way the society perceived things, changed the way we relate, we talk, no more shaking hands. In Africa, it's many of you who have been in Africa, you must greet, you must shake hands. And like in Europe, it's high, high. Like in Menudia now, I meet guys running around, you know, it's high, high, you know, as if we don't know each other. And that is the norm, that is the norm here. But at home, we must shake hands. So coming from that background and to this reality, it's, it was a complete change for me. But I was also sudden with the rollout of the vaccine. I was also sudden to see, you know, um, I'm not blaming the global north completely, but seeing the level of selfishness. I thought that, I thought that uh, you know, there will be concerted efforts from the international community or the leaders of the world to tackle, come together and tackle this uh, uh, pandemic from the beginning, from onset. But that wasn't the case. We saw cases of, you know, individuals addressing it in different ways. We saw Trump there, you know, and even back in Kenya, Tanzania took a different direction. The man in Tanzania, they even, you know, completely denied it. Brazil, we see cases are still going up. The government still denies it. So, and yet all that was allowed to linger for so long. A lot of conspiracy theories against the COVID, the COVID vaccine, you know, that has made many people in Africa not even to go near it despite the fact that the government is bringing out to the doors, doorsteps. But all those uh, conspiracy theories were allowed to linger for so long. You know, people also, the pastors, the, you know, men, men in the pulpit too, didn't help out issues. Some of them associated, spiritualized the whole thing and condemned the vaccine even before it was rolled out. So uh, there was a lot of confusion. And I think um, it will take a while before we come out of it. Nobody knows it all. And a few weeks here in Ireland, again, over questions about the use of certain vaccine like uh, AstraZeneca, with the, you know some cases that were reported, and that is what our people are receiving in in you know in Kenya. They just say, "God, I hope it, nothing will happen to our people." So there's a lot of co confusion there. So which one is the way to go? So those are that is the dilemma the world is in now. And I, I, my lesson is that I wish the world will learn from this, uh, you know, and value the importance of working together, importance of networking, collaborating, in fighting against these global pandemics. I think that, that, that will be helpful. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I think that's, um, that's really helpful. And I think we can learn from the pandemic in a number of ways. And I think Patrick's right, it's too early to say what we're gonna learn from it. <clears throat> but it does reveal the startling inter interdependencies of our world it does reveal the very, very delicate balance between environment and society. It does reveal what, what you know, uh, deforestation is doing, what certain agricultural practices are doing. The sort of um, extraordinary arrogance of some world leaders, vaccine nationalism reveals a certain, um, certain reality about our world and what we have to do. I, I think um, the, Conscious disinformation about um, about the nature of COVID is again is another prompt, and it all points towards you know to come back to that topic, the need for emancipatory education, the need for a capacity to be reflexive, to be agentic, to take power uh, and, and act in the world in order to to arrive at an ecologically sane and just society. You know, I, I think that's the big lesson. Uh, whether we'll 
heat it or not is another thing. On, on, you know, there are some advantages in terms of limiting travel or whatever, but I think my experience has been of a disturbance or a lack because I think we learn so much in embodied encounters from each other. I think we can use virtual uh, means and you know we, we shouldn't be traveling hither or thither it, it, given, given the nature of the climate and the environment, but there is something irreplaceable in the novelty and subtlety of, of learning with other human beings and face-to-face. -face. So probably a little bit downbeat, Paddy, you were looking for, for positive lessons, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to give them. I'm looking for that word hope that we mentioned earlier. <laughs> yes. Neve, have you any thoughts? <laughs> on the same downbeat, no, I'll start. I'll start on the positive. Um, in terms of, um, we, we had discussions before, like how can you maintain, you know, Frarian pedagogy in an online context? And you know, there's been really amazing innovation by educators uh, during this time, uh, particularly in community education. Um, so there's been a lot of, you know, positive aspects. Even the course that I mentioned there, that was all done online. But I don't think we can get away with you know, from the research that we've done engaging with community education groups and, and learners, the impact of COVID on their learning. I mean, with regard to mental health, I don't think it can be under, underestimated in terms of the disconnect, that human interaction, the need for that. Um, now, educators find different ways of phone calls, posting things out, doing a huge amount to maintain that connection. But for people who are least likely to engage in education, it's going to be very difficult uh, to encourage them back in. And many learners say to us they wouldn't come back online again, and particularly learners who are learning at the early levels of the national framework of qualifications, they wouldn't do it again. So I know that's not really positive. And then there's the issue of digital poverty, you know, access to devices, Wi-Fi, and the skills to be able to engage. And if we're going to be continuing in this format, there has to be accessibility for everybody through the tools to be able to engage online. And then one of the biggest things that has come up with community education is there a rise in domestic violence and, you know, women not being able to engage with caring responsibilities. So I know that's really um, the negative things, but I think it is really important that, you know, th they're noted. And then additionally, I suppose the rise of the right wing agenda that we've seen. And again, absolute need for this kind of education as well, because uh, that's something that, you know, I would be fearful of, and that's something that community education, anybody who's involved in popular education would have been aware of for a number of years. I think it's really come to the fore during um, COVID. So I think there are some positive aspects, but, uh, and what colleagues have been saying on the panel, I suppose it has shone a light on inequalities and there is more, I suppose, of a focus on it. Um, but I think there's, um, a huge amount to address um, based on the fallout of COVID, particularly for adult learning. Thanks, Neve. Uh, Alice, I know you've mentioned COVID a couple of times, and and that's what that's what made me want to bring it back into the front of the discussion. If there's anything you just want to quickly add, because I'm I'm under orders to try and wrap up fairly soon, but is there anything you want to underscore, like even in terms of what you'd said already about public pedagogies or so forth? No, no, if we need to wrap, make it, make a, make it a wrap. I um, didn't mind, sorry, I didn't mean to cut no, you short. If there's no, any. no, not at all. I think, I think everything's been, you know, I agree with, with what everybody else has, has said. I mean, there are opportunities, um, but um, yeah, there's, there's, there's not a parity <laughs> um, between opportunities and fallout, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Maybe for, for, we'll just take one last word, and I mean one word maybe from, from each of you, just in terms of, uh, is there anything that you found really useful, Jane Thompson talks about really useful knowledge, that you heard any of the other panelists say this evening, you know, that you would say, yeah, if you're talking to your friends, partners, uh, associates later on you say well I heard one thing at this and this is what it was you know that you will take away with you as a kind of a, a hope for emancipatory education. I, uh, from Alice I, would, I took uh, I'm taking a lived curriculum 
lived curriculum. Curriculum. That's two words, but we'll accept that. <laughs> the, the pointer of that term, the surname is A O K I, Aoki. It's actually quite uh, an old, um, he did this work many, I think it might have been in the 70s or the 80s even. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a great, there's a, I just came across it a couple of, I guess it might've been last year or the year before. So yeah, lots, lots there. Okay. And I think what I, what I took from people, I mean, I've been working with um, a lot of secondary students in post-primary um, students, as well as university students. And because I think part of our, or part of my sort of mobilization in terms of education is as much within and toward the, the institutional structures um, of education, um, governance, as well as delivery. Um, but I'm taking with me, because I learned more about, you know, and was also just reminded of the, the structural constraints around funding and things like that with adult ed and, and all of the, the peripheralized sort of uh, opportunities and spaces of education. Um, and I think that we, I mean, I already felt like that, that there needs to be more cross institutional or cross sector work between university and secondary post-primary. Um, but also I think, I, I think that would be, because I, I just feel like all of the justice work that I'm doing, that also includes within the education system itself. So I would be really, really um, interested in kind of widening um, my, you know, community of practice with, with you guys working in, you know, because I think we've got a, a battle of changing that discourse and that language, because it's just, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's it, it it's undermining its own yes goals. Okay. Thanks, Alice. Uh, Neve, do you want to have one or two words of what you would what you heard that you would take with you? Two words: indigenous knowledge. I want to take mm. that from from this. I thought it was very powerful. Yes. Thank you. That is two as well. Yeah. Fergal. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, you're never going to get one, just one word. Uh, the, 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 I, I don't want to pick one particular point from, from what people say. I do want to say, I think that shared passion, shared concerns is the source of powerful solidarities. And I think I do hear that in this room. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's actually what I was going to say to, to, to wrap up. So thank you for, for stealing my words. I just want to say thanks to a, each of our contributors this evening uh, and for those that, that sent comments in. I'm sorry we didn't have time to uh, respond to all the contributions, but I've been left with a sense of encouragement from what I heard this evening, actually, and, 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 that, and hope as well, uh, that education can indeed be a powerful agent for change, but it's a work in progress to quote Neve earlier, you know, and I think we have to keep reminding that, that, that we, you know, it's an ongoing process. Um, um, I think uh, what I heard is that we're all rooted in the core values of, of people, uh, belief in people, respect for people's ideas. Uh, I was hearing that. Um, and a desire to share knowledge, not only about what, but about why and how we can all learn from each other. And it can be genuinely transformative. Um, um, so I just hope that uh, for those viewers and people logging in later on to see the, the video, that they will have seen the values and perspectives that, I, uh, that we all hold in common, I suppose, and if you were as impressed, illuminated or inspired as I was by what you heard, then please take time to like the video and uh, subscribe and share it with your friends and associates. Uh, and if you don't feel the same way, uh, that's okay too. You don't need to share. Uh, but I thank you for your interest and attention anyway because if you've stayed with us this far, you must have been interested in something.
So thank you for that. So on behalf of COLOV and the Department of International Development at Maynooth and for all our contributors, uh, Alice, Patrick, Neve and Fergal, uh, I say thank you very much and uh, good night.